Welcome to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast, where we hear from some of the most relevant, up-to-date, informational speakers in our industry. In episode 15, Dr. Terence McGonigal, a professor at Brandon University, tells his story, Evaluation of Soil Health Under Different Grazing Management Systems in Manitoba. Here I am. Well, I, I, I have, for some years, been studying soils and plants. And um, it came to my attention that so there was a lot of interest in, uh, in soil health. So I started looking at that uh, in collaboration with uh, Manitoba Beef Forage uh, Initiatives. And I'm talking today about uh, soil health under different uh, grazing uh, management. So what is soil health and uh, how do we measure it? So uh, you can look at production-based criteria you can say, okay, well, 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 we'll see how much forage is produced, we'll see how, uh, what the animal weight gains are. And that's looking back in time. You're looking at the production that has occurred uh, up to this point. But if you want to look to the future, if you want to be predictive, then you're going to have to have some kind of indicator of soil health. You want to pick up a handful of soil and say, okay, well, what, what can I measure on the soil that tells me it's got good, good health or not? What in- indicator can I, can I, can I use? And uh, there are certain soil properties that uh, are somewhat fixed. So we could look at texture, uh, you know, obviously a 95% sand or a 65% clay are gonna have some limits on on production. We could look at an acid soil, a pH, then that's gonna have some limits on production as well. Soil organic carbon is gonna be a big player here. Uh, We could talk about organic matter. Uh, The units change a little bit. We'd say 7% organic matter would be uh, 4% uh, organic carbon. So that's the same thing, just changing the units. Or I I could, instead of saying 4% organic carbon, I could say 40 grams per kilogram. So I can switch, so it's just saying the same thing uh, three different ways. The units can change, but soil organic carbon then, our organic matter, then that's going to, uh, it's gonna be where the the, the minerals are being being released from, and it's gonna improve uh, water holding capacity of soil and, and the soil structure. So that's going to be important for soil health, perhaps. But the temperature and, and rainfall being, uh, being good, then the other thing that's going to be driving our production is, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the fertility. And, and we're going to have aspects of the uh, mineralization, the release of nutrients from the uh, residues, nitrogen fixation, where we're inputting uh, new uh, ammonia into the, into the system from, from atmospheric nitrogen, or mycorrhizae, where we've got fungi helping the roots to get the minerals out of the soil. But the point I'm making here is that all three here of the fertility facts are, 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 are microbes. It's all about microbes in the soil. So if we're gonna have a healthy soil that's gonna drive production, then it's gonna be something to do with microbes in the soil. So the work on grazing at uh, Brookdale has uh, uh, been arranged into these uh, replicates. There are seven blocks or replicates labeled uh, A to G. Uh, and, and in each one, we have um, the continuous is the red, and the planned is the uh, 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 yellow orange here. So in a, in a given replicate, we've got this uh, continuous area here where the cows move freely for the season. And then in, in, in the planned, they're, they're moving uh, uh, from paddock to paddock, just a few days. And continuous, they can go right across the whole site. These little uh, lines, so these blue lines are just virtual. There's no actual barrier there. The cows can move freely across the entire site in the continuous uh, as they choose. So this is, and so this is a, a statistically replicated and randomized design where we can look at different outcomes from continuous and planned grazing uh, if we choose to. So soil health, what would we expect under uh, different uh, grazing? So we've got here uh, continuous and planned. Well, we might expect that the, the grazing would be of low selectivity in the planned because the cows have got no choice. They have to eat what's in front of them, whereas they can be more picky uh, in the continuous grazing, whereas there'd be a long rest period in the planned grazing. They eat today, and then they won't come back for uh, quite a while. So the plants have a rest period from grazing, and that will encourage good growth of the the forage, getting the nutrients back into the soil, getting roots to once again feed into the soil. So those two things should promote, we would expect, uh, better soil health in planned. 
but it's going to cost more management. It's going to be more labor intensive uh, on the other side of the coin. So how should we evaluate soil health in terms of microbes? If microbes are going to be the key, how do you do that? Well, you can count the microbes, or you could measure their activity by respiration. And there's a method I've been using to count the microbes where you fumigate the soil. You take a bit of chloroform to a sample of soil, and that will kill the microbes. And then you get a flush of carbon released, which you can extract, dissolved organic carbon, into an extract and measure that. And thereby you can, by this flush of released uh, dissolved carbon, you can get a measure of how much the microbe biomass is that's present. And I've been wondering if this is a possible tool to evaluate soil health if we're looking at the quantity of microbes. I'll also later on look at respiration as well as another possible alternative. And then you want an absolute scale, a benchmark. Where are we going to put pin this on the, on, on the big picture here? The, the, how do we benchmark this? What's a healthy soil? What's a not healthy soil to compare our data to? So we might possibly consider one approach here would be um, the comparison of croplands and grasslands. Where we, if we said that, okay, well, in a grassland, you have uh, root inputs are uh, throughout the entire period, that's going to feed the microbes. Whereas in croplands, you've got, you've got times when there's nothing there. We've also got uh, more disturbance in a cropland, so that's going to encourage loss of organic matter by, uh, uh, by aerating the soil and uh, being respired away. So we could, based on these two considerations, expect more input of carbon to the soil in a grassland and uh, it being kept there longer in a grassland so that relative to a cropland, there'd be more soil health in terms of microbes. Of course, in a cropland, you can, uh, you can sustain the outputs by, by putting in additional inputs like fertilizers. So I went to the literature with the help from, help from Will Turner, and this data here is a so-called meta-analysis. What we do there is we take a stack of papers from the literature and extract the data out of there and then rework it into a new calculation. That's what a meta-analysis means. So the, the graph here is for microbial biomass carbon against soil organic carbon. And you can see it's a, it's a straight line. Now, that wasn't new, uh, because that's been found before. But what I found that was new that we published was that we have a different line for cropland compared to grassland. It's a, it's a steeper line for, for the grasslands. And so what I'm arguing is that we've got more per unit of soil organic carbon, per unit of soil organic matter, you get more microbes in a cropland, sorry, in a grassland, than you do uh, in a grassland. Uh, and so if, uh, if we, uh, if we uh, based on the arguments I've presented, we say that there might be better soil health in a grassland compared to a cropland, then the microbial biomass would be then a reasonable measure, an indicator of soil health by that argument. You can see here, the numbers in percentages at the end, that's the slope of the line. The, the, the numbers in the squares is the slope. So if we divide the y-axis by the x-axis, the slope of the line, so that says that about 2.7 or 3% of the soil organic carbon is microbes in the grassland, whereas only about 1% of the soil organic carbon is microbes uh, in the cropland. So we went out to, uh, to Brookdale and uh, sampled the different grazing systems. Here's some data for the soil organic carbon through time. The, the, the different grazing treatments began in 2016, and so we've had two years there. The sample size here, N, is very large to begin with because we kept all the soil samples separate from one another. And then subsequently, uh, in, the, in the next samplings, we put them together into composite or pooled samples in the same bag. So the sample size goes down. And you can see here how steady the soil organic carbon is. This is grams per kilogram, which is about 42 or 43. And you can see, I'll go back to the previous grass, graph. So we're about here. And you'll see with the microbial biomass carbon data is going to be right on this grassland line here, up at about nine, 950 to 1,000 milligrams per kilogram. So our Brookdale site is right. These data here are for the, the these are for the planet. There's data here from Missouri, Iowa, um, Illinois, uh, Manitoba, uh, Germany, UK. This is, this, is, this is the Northern Hemisphere data. 
one point is for one different trial. So this is the big picture kind of data. And then we go to, so that's where we fit in Brookdale, at about that 40 mark there. And you can see how, how stable the soil organic carbon is. Uh, look at the standard deviations. They're very, very small. That means that it's very, uh, it doesn't vary very much. Each sample comes out the same, 42, 42.1, 42.2. They come out the same every day, again and again. And it's very stable because it would appear that over 6,000 years following the retreat of the glacier ice, then there's been a period of, of, of root inputs from the grass that's covered that site to give this carbon enrichment that's very stable and even across the site, whereas the clay is very variable. The standard deviations are much higher. Clay varies from one point in space to another. As you walk across the site, 5% clay here. Go a little bit over there, 30% clay. It varies a lot because of the way the ice melted and the, the, uh, the, the clays were deposited from the glaciers. It's very, very patchy across the site. So what's the answer then to, do we find any difference in the microbes? The answer is absolutely no. I don't find any difference. These numbers here are not different statistically. They're the average is a very large sampling. So we've got in 2016, these numbers are the same approximately. They're not statistically different. We've got no difference between the, between the planned and the continuous in terms of the microbiomass. And we've got values that fit right on our grassland line with a slope of about 2.1, 2.2% of the organic carbon being microbes. Where it varies is when we look at the clays. Here, here's the clays from 5% to 30% for one of the replicates there. And uh, here's our microbial biomass carbon. As the clays go up, we lose microbes, presumably because of the, the combination of clays together with the organic matter are shielding the organic matter, so the microbes can't get it. It's tucked away in clay humus complexes that the, the mi microbes can't get to. So we have here no effect of the uh, planned and continuous across this uh, range of clays here. And we've sampled again in 2017, three different times presented here. Once again, the same story. No difference uh, between the planned and continuous in this measure of uh, microbiomass and no difference in our part of the organic carbon that is microbes, always coming out the same. How do I interpret that then? Do I, do I, there's two ways to look at it. I can either say, well, we know there's a difference in soil health, so this measure fails to find it. That's one possible way to look at it. Another way would be to say, well, whatever's going on in terms of production out there, there's no difference in the soil health after two years because we can't find any difference in the microbes. There's two possible interpretations. There is a difference in the, in, in the cover. This is percent cover of forage, and what we do for that is we put a pin down into the envir environment very many times, and each time a leaf touches the pin, you make a count. And so you get three or four leaf touches per pin, and in that way, you can get a percent that exceeds 100. And for a grassland or a, a prairie, uh, the, the, the percent of a cover, the total green foliage there, is around about 400%. How can that be, you might ask? Well, the, the vegetation layers. So if you're looking with a bird's eye view, everything adds to 100%. But if you put pins down into the environment to, to count by touches, you, you get layering. So it's actually higher than that overall. You get about 400% cover. And these are the top eight forages uh, that are there. And I've highlighted C and D for meadow brome, chickpea milk vetch, and alfalfa, because C and D, the replicates at Brookdale, were the native pastures. They were never seeded. And so you can see they're absent. Those three are absent. They've obviously introduced to the other, uh, the other replicates, where we've got, uh, 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 <coughs> you have here, in those ones, we've got the, the native grasses occurring as they, as they do. So when you look at the effect of the, um, the, the grazing treatments, we actually find that meadow brome is statistically reduced under planned grazing. And I've expressed it here, the average, is, average percent cover excluding C and D where it's uh, absent. So we've gone down from about 100% cover down to about 36% cover in response to the planned grazing. And, and how would that have occurred then? Well, perhaps then because uh, meadow brome is uh, growing early in the year, the cows got onto the field in June, 
And by that time, it's, it's done sufficient growth that uh, the cows are actually, uh, they must be uh, uh, passing over it. And, and, and whereas in the planned grazing, they can't avoid, they can't avoid eating it. They have, they have to eat it because they have to eat everything because there's no choice. They're at high stocking rates. So there's, in some way, the, the meadow brome is escaping grazing in the continuous because the cows are choosing not to eat it. Maybe it's past its prime because it's an early season grower. Uh, whereas in the plant, so we've, we've got a shift here. We're losing meadow brome in the plant. That's statistically significant. Whereas the other ones don't change as yet. We've got a, a trend here maybe for more cover in the plant grazing, but it's not significant statistically. That's only a 13% probability value, so not significant. Let me talk about respiration. This is from Wikipedia. So you can measure respiration by putting a, a, a tool, this little box, on the soil surface and measure milligrams of carbon coming off per, uh, per, uh, per kilogram per day. And, and that, that data there is for differences in temperature. I summarized it. It, it goes from two to four milligrams per kilogram per day. That's what you measure coming right off the soil surface. And there's a measure proposed for a lot of people in the US are using what they call the Haney method or Solvita method. And what they're doing there is they measure respiration on a soil sample. They bring it in, but they dry it. They sieve it, they dry it, and then they re-wet it and to 50% moisture holding capacity. And they put it in a flask, and then you can measure the carbon dioxide that comes off. You get a little trap here. There's a, am I missing something here? The bottom of the test tube should be there. Maybe it's missing. And uh, you can see that, that the, the carbon dioxide will be captured in the, in the solution in the test tube, and you can measure it. Uh, so you, you get the so-called burst of carbon dioxide that comes off over the first five or six days following you do this. So what kind of data do they get when they do this? The data here from Haney, he's the champion of this in the US, Haney, from 2008. So he tried 36, 36 different soils, and they range to low pH, high pH, and low organic matter, high p organic matter. And he got a range of values for his test of, well, you can see the values, up to, up to 70 milligrams per kilogram per day. So that's an order of magnitude higher, more than 10 times higher than you get in the field. So it's a burst of carbon dioxide coming off the soil, way higher than you get in the field. And he can drive it higher still. He gets 25 on one soil here, and he adds... He adds uh, some compost manure up to 80 tons per acre rate, and he pushes it up to 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. So you get this burst of carbon dioxide comes off from this dry, wet cycle, and uh, you can push it even higher with adding more um, amendments, like, like a compost manure. Okay? So is that going to tell us something about soil health? And what is this burst? Why is it higher? I think it's because the drying kills the microbes, in part. And there's some data to support that from uh, Mirando, another paper I'm quoting here, where they, in the upper figure here, they've got field moist soil compared to air dried soil. And here's our microbial biomass using fumigation extraction using the chloroform. And across these different soils, they get a 15% reduction on average in the microbiomass by the dry, wet cycle. And you can see the big burst of carbon dioxide given off in the respiration in the same comparison of using the field moist soil and the air dried soil. So I think what's going on here is that this, this, this uh, measure of soil health using the burst method of Haney is, I think what it's doing is, is doing a 15% microbe kill. So my summary, my conclusions, grazing management, no change in microbe standing crop over two years, not that I could find. And uh, soil organic carbon stable over these two years, as measured by um, the uh, loss of mass on taking the temperature of the soil from 105 degrees C up to 400 degrees C. That burns off the carbon, organic carbon. So that's stable at 42 grams per, uh, per, per, per kilogram. And meadow brome seems to be under pressure in the plant grazing. For the microbes, is this an indicator of soil health or not? I still ask the question, I think I need to keep studying it. Uh, there's a clay effect, certainly. We've got less microbes when we get more clay. And this burst of CO2 from the dry wet cycle appears to be a microbe kill effect in part. So what do I want to do? I want to go back to the field in 2018 
Uh, keep following this uh, forage uh, percent cover response. Keep following the microbes and expand the study to, to measure the field uh, moist soil and the dry wet cycle soil for uh, this burst of carbon dioxide to, get a, to try and get the whole picture, to try and use every tool that we possibly can to try and understand the soil health in terms of the microbe activity and the microbe quantity and see if things can uh, begin to change a bit more as the time proceeds with these grazing trials. And also I want to uh, get out to more, more farms. If anyone here has a situation they'd like to share with me, I'm, I'm welcoming uh, uh, opportunities to come out and take some soil samples. If you've got a spot where you think this is a low soil health, this is a high soil health, let me come and take a sample and see if I can build up my data set, my, my database here of, uh, of, of, of information to try and figure out what's really going on. We're talking about, so I was talking about soil health. Can we measure it? I'd like to come out there into the community and measure it some more. And uh, acknowledgements, thanks. Kaylin Little, a lot of the data there was from Kaylin, uh, supported by MBFI. Thanks very much to these folks who are fantastic. At, uh, uh, everybody at MBFI, especially the, these guys who have helped me out and technical expertise from Jennifer at the university. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. That was a pretty sciencey talk. There was a lot of data. So Darren, thanks for hanging in there. First question. Sir. Yes, right. So the question is, what about the diversity of microbes? Instead of how many microbes, or what is their activity, which microbes? Right, and that, that is actually, the technology is really coming to a, a much more uh, available form for us to actually answer that question. Uh, it is possible now to take a soil sample and extract the DNA and to obtain a profile of uh, uh, the different types of microbes that are present. And uh, I'm actually working with a collaborator uh, at the university to, to, to do just that, to, 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 to make a measure. What you actually do is you end up with a, uh, a sample of, um, uh, 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 you can get the count of how many different uh, uh, of bacteria types you get uh, in different categories uh, based on your, your DNA analysis. So there, it is possible, and I haven't done it, and I'd like to do it, and the technology is really there, and I'm, I'm working on that. Yeah. So it's possible. You may get a difference in the types of bacteria or the types of fungi that are there, but we're doing that, and we have some samples from MBFI that are to be uh, uh, processed for the DNA analysis for that. Sir. Sure. Keep them happy. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, well, the same thing that you do, for, I would imagine, uh, for, uh, for any system is, is, is all, of the, all, of the syst all of the management practices that promote microbe activity are all the ones that they seem to be using in, in organic agriculture as far as anything that gets roots, living roots, into the soil. Uh, as much as possible, it's because the, as the roots uh, uh, live in the soil, they're, they're, they're leaky. They leak, they leak out sugars and amino acids, which are feeding the microbes, and then they die, and, and that contributes to the uh, that root that, that root litter, as it were, is contributing to all of that. Contributes to that input below ground is feeding the microbes and, and promoting their growth. So any 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 management such as cover crops and, 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 and intercropping or whatever whatever system can be used to maintain as much. Uh, actual vegetation cover for as long as possible is, is the way to promote the microbes in any system, whether it's the clay, a clay or, or another texture. But within clays, it's a, a, a particular challenge because you've got um, this, as it were, this, uh, this, uh, this, this inaccessibility of some of the organic matter to the microbes based on the clay humus complexes. Sir. So yeah, you, you, what I did, my method for, for grams of carbon per kilogram of soil. So you take a, take a soil sample, you can take it today, you can take it tomorrow, you can, you can take it at this depth, you can take it at that depth. But your, your calculation then would be changes with space and time in the quantity uh, that you have. Your, your measure of how much carbon is there in your sample 
uh, there are various options for that. So what I did was called loss on ignition, where you, 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 you heat the soil to 105 degrees C to drive off the water, and then you take it to 400 degrees C for 16 hours, which dries off the organic carbon, and the loss of mass is your organic matter. Right? So there's a method, and then you can take multiple samples in space and time to follow changes in space and time. Is that the kind of question you're, you're seeking an answer to? Or? So, yeah, it, and, and I don't see why you shouldn't be able to work on a soil measure of, of carbon. I mean, well, it's not a difficult method. All you need is a muffle furnace that'll heat a soil sample to 400 degrees C, and then you can measure the uh, organic carbon in soil. It's very straightforward. We, we do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds all the time. It's not, it's not a difficult the method. You need a four-place four place balance, you need a muffle furnace, and you need a, uh, a system to heat soil to 105 degrees C as well, a, a fan oven. So it, but it's, it's, this is all basic lab, lab stuff. It's not, nothing complicated. It is basic lab stuff. A regular lab, any regular lab can do that. Uh, well, this, uh, what I've done here is to take these soil samples over the two years of 2016 and 2017 and find with samples, uh, a large number of samples in space and a large number of samples through time that I find no difference at this time over two years. It's very steady at 42 or 43 uh, grams per kilogram organic carbon about 4% organic carbon or 7% organic matter. It's absolutely steady. It hasn't changed at this site under this management in, as far as I can measure it. Elsewhere, no, I haven't done it elsewhere in agricultural systems here, no. I have done it elsewhere, completely different set of circumstances, and I have seen it change with time. Yes, I did do it when I was in Idaho for four years, and I measured, I measured changes in organic carbon in soil over a... a uh, over an eight-year period and found, found differences, yeah. That was where there, there was uh, some, some subsoil was brought up to the surface and then you could measure how it would stratify at the surface getting uh, down in layers from the surface with time. Okay, so yeah, I have done that and it can be done, yeah. But here we find no differences over two years in, in these different management practices. Right, so what we did was to, um, we didn't go onto the field when the, when the cows were on the field, so we would, would, would follow uh, behind the cows. So as the cows would move off, then we would go in uh, immediately afterwards to take the samples. So. So um, what I'm describing to you is what we did in the first year where we kept all the samples separate. Remember I said I had 240 samples. So we kept all of the different soil cores separate. So we, it took such a long time to do the sampling that we had to like, follow the cows through the experiment. But the subsequent samples, the August 2016 and the May, June and August 2017, we were actually able to get in and out of the field much more quickly. Uh, because we took a composite sample where we did the entire experiment in, in just two days. So in that case, uh, when we went in and sampled in 
in, uh, in May and June and August 2017, we would have been sampling the entire experiment and, and the cows in, in, in the planned grazing would only be in one position. So as we sample in replicate G, for example, they may have just come off of replicate G a few days ago, but at the same time we're sampling A and B and C and E and they hadn't been on there for a while. So in a sense we've done that. And, 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 and I still don't find, uh, uh, even though we've sampled through uh, the two years at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the August in the second year, still finding no difference. Those soils have been, those, those planned grazing ones have had the cows on and off uh, a, a small number of times uh, 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 into the paddock for grazing a couple of times in 2016, once again a couple of times in 2017. But apart from those grazing visits, our August sample in 2017, most of those two years they haven't been on there. And still, I still find no difference. This, this is a great discussion, and I, I'm sorry, to have, maybe I should cut it off for a minute. Um, I know that uh, the session does end at 3.15, but there's lots, of, I'm sure there's lots of questions out there. I do want to, uh, first of all, thank Terence, uh, Dr. McGonagall here for his presentation. Thanks for tuning in to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast. We'll see you next year from January 22nd to 24th, 2019.